everybody. Thanks so much for joining our session today. Um, Elizabeth and I are really excited to talk to you about this uh, topic, which I will tell you when someone sits down. Okay, so how one federal program, that's the Elizabeth side, uh, used Google Analytics 4, that's the me side, uh, to surface untapped data and understand their content. So I swear there will be more clarity to what this means in a minute. Uh, so. I'm Emily Patterson, so I run my own little mini agency that's just basically me and a couple of contractors, um, and I do basically exactly what this presentation is about. I do analytics consulting um, about websites, um, marketing, advertising campaigns for nonprofit and government clients. So if you need me, just Google uh, v Measure, and hopefully my website will come up. And my name is Elizabeth Costello. Um, I work at um, JSI Research and Training Institute. We are a public health um, consulting um, firm, and we work a lot with um, federal government and the um, U.S. federal government. We all work with USAID, uh, most all around health projects, um, HHS, HRSA, CDC. Um, and websites are a very tiny little piece of our portfolio, but a really important piece of supporting a lot of the training and technical assistance that we provide. Um, so I'm going to talk about today about one of the one of the projects that we support um, for the Office of Population Affairs. Great. So what are we covering today? Here's our agenda. So first off, this is mostly focused on a case study. So uh, Elizabeth's going to talk about the project, the problem that they were having at uh, RHNTC um, with this contract that her company has, um, why we decided on the course of action that we did with uh, GA4. So just there's a lot of acronyms in here. I know it's uh, GovCon, so everyone is used to lots of acronyms. But just in case, um, GA4 is Google Analytics 4. It's the new version of Google Analytics that came out about two years ago. Um, and then we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about Google Tag Manager, um, also often abbreviated in here as GTM, and Google Analytics, and kind of the process I used for setting up all of this um, data capture. And then we're going to talk a little bit about if you want to do something similar in your own organization, um, what are the steps, and um, who do you need to have on your team to make that happen. So, uh, oh. so Okay. So we're, we're, we are making some assumptions. We, we assume you have a very basic understanding of what Google Analytics is and what it can do and some of the very most basic data points that you can get um, out, of, out of Google Analytics. This is basically my understanding before I started working with Emily. Um, you can see page views, sessions, get some user demographics. Um, we also um, hope that you know there was a shift from something that was called Universal Analytics to Google Analytics 4, GA4. Um, this is a, you know, this is just about, this is not about that shift, so we're not going to talk about that shift. Um, and then you may know how to add a Google tag to a Drupal site. We're also not covering that today. So just the assumptions about we, what we will and will not cover. So the problem we were trying to solve is, again, whether you're a federally funded entity or project, we all have reporting requirements, right? To, so in my case, to our funders, we have monthly reporting, we have every six months, every, every year, we're providing all kinds of different reports. Um, and we know that you know, Google Analytics provides a, a free and pretty easy way for us to access our Drupal website analytics, but the problem we were hitting was that those really basic GA report, uh, Google Analytics reports, the page views, the sessions, whatnot, they were not really aligning with our content strategy, with our reporting goals, and it wasn't, it wasn't able to tell our story to our funder of, of, of how the content was being, actually being accessed. Um, so what do we do then? So this is our project. I'm going to do a quick case study on the um, RHNTC. That stands for the Reproductive Health National Training Center. So this is a um, federally funded project funded by, um, actually by the Office of Population Affairs and also the Office on Women's Health. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here from a screenshot from our website, we are go-to resource for family planning and adolescent health training and technical assistance. Um, so we, we support a whole network of grantees across the U.S. who have federal training requirements. Um, they come to this, come to this site. Um, and you can see at the top there's this blue bar asking which type of content. We actually serve two primary audiences, grantees that are funded by 
the Title X Family Planning Program and grantees that are funded by the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. And that's in, important for our, our content strategy that we have one website serving two pretty diverse audiences that have different, different needs to access training and resources. So we had, a, we had a pretty big measurement problem. We have hundreds of resources on our website. Um, we have over 1,300 training lists. So this website allows any user to create a training administrator account, and they can create their own curated lists of training and resources on the site to share with their, with their networks and track their training completion. So it's a, it's a quasi learning management system. And then we offer evaluations for e-learnings and evaluations for archived webinars so people can get certificates of completion. All this different content, this is just some of the content on the site, is tagged by those two primary audiences, those two different grantee groups. We also have, we have three, act three different cooperative agreements from a funding perspective. So while we are one project on the front end, we have reporting requirements to three, for three different funders and they want to see what did I pay for and how did it perform they don't really care always about everything else right um, we also um, from a taxonomy perspective the those you know resources are all tagged into different resource categories and then um, more granularly with different resource topics but the problem was we had all this data but it was not the right data if you if you're familiar with Google Analytics and you know how to do a page view report, it tells you every single page on your site and how many page views you had. It doesn't tell you anything about what type of resource it was, who, who was the, you know, what was the funding source, who was the audience for that, what was the resource category, what was the topic. So I didn't know how to, do, how to get that information besides manually going through the, the you know, CSV output and tagging that, which was just, not going to happen. So we did not really have an ability to um, to really understand the audience behavior aligned with our content strategy um, and how demonstrate that impact. So just for an example, there's this quick screenshot of our website. Um, these are just some of the training categories at the top, and then you know financial operations, and then there's training topics within. So if, when you go to you know choose one of those pages, you end up you end up on a, a filtered page where you can drill down. So that's just showing the taxonomy on the front end. We also have lots of toolkits as a way to organize resources. And these are longer scrolling pages with, with lots of resources embedded in them, sometimes 15, sometimes 20, 30 different internal links. Um, and then each toolkit has its own side hand menu. We had no information about how people were interacting with these pages um, once they came to them. We could get the page views, but we didn't really have engagement. We didn't know what the most um, you know, access resources were. Were people using those navigation menus? So it was very frustrating to me as you know, the content owner of the website not to be able to kind of tell that story through the data. So we, do have, we did have our first Google Analytics dashboard. This was built when we were using Universal Analytics. And you, we, could, we could look up an individual resource and see how it's performing. And we can see just overall across the site the page views. But again, this did not differentiate by those, by those different categories that I was showing you earlier that we need to report on um, our, our funder, the training, the topics, whatnot. So I attended Drupal GovCon virtually in 2021. And Emily was giving a talk on how to get data out of long form content like toolkits and it was like such a light bulb for me i was like this is my exact problem and i messaged emily after the the conference and um, asked her if she could work with me on my website and here we are two years later and i will pass it back to emily great okay so now i'm going to talk a little bit about yeah the technical now that you understand all of the issues that um, elizabeth's team was having with pulling data about uh, their content. I'm going to talk about the technical side of how we address this problem. So this is, this is my great graphic design. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. Uh, anyway, so we have a, we have a journey here. Um, we're over here in, we're going on a road trip from Chicago to my house in Charlottesville. And we, we know where we have the starting point. So we have all of this data. Um, in the back end of Drupal um, that we would like to surface somehow. 
And we know ultimately where we want to be. Obviously, we didn't have the dashboard designed to start with, but we knew ultimately we wanted some way for Elizabeth's team to be able to easily go in and um, see, you know, by funding source, how many views were different pieces of content getting, you know, by um, program area, you know, what were the most popular resources. Like, so we, we knew it ultimately the outcome that we wanted. Um, so how do you get there? This is uh, the definitely, I tried to boil it down into four steps because we only have uh, 45 minutes for this presentation. So um, step number one uh, is defining what data you need in the first place. So I do a, a lot of technical training and people are, are always like, hey, I just wanna know how to use the program. And I, I feel like I have to get into PSA mode and I have these like little lectures that I give. So I'm gonna make you first sit through my PSA about how before you dive into Tag Manager or Google Analytics or any like actual program, you need to take a step back and kind of um, get the human side of things under control first. So we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, step two is to get the data. Um, before you can use Tag Manager, you need to surface the data where Tag Manager can access it. So I'll talk about that. Uh, step three is to then use Tag Manager, so many different uh, programs here, to send the data into Google Analytics and then using the Google Analytics data, we can um, build a dashboard on top of it so that the teams can actually access and use it. All right, so uh, I added those steps to our road trip using <laughs> a great graphic design background. So now instead of a straightforward route from Chicago to uh, Charlottesville, we have um, with three extra pit stops along the way. <laughs> so. First off, before we get into any like actual technical things, I think the most important thing you, and when I do training, I feel like this is really actually very difficult for people to grasp, so I, I like to spend a little bit of time on it, is to step back and make sure that you understand what people are asking for and you can translate that into what data you need to collect to answer those questions. Um, so I find that Google Analytics data can be hard to understand because it's so abstract. So we're gonna take a real life example and pretend that instead we're collecting data about weddings. <laughs> okay, so um, we're gonna say that uh, you have a friend, uh, her name's Courtney and she's a wedding planner and she gets lots of questions from her clients about stuff at like what's popular with weddings these days. So she goes to a lot of weddings and in order to answer these clients' questions, she's like, I'm gonna make a checklist of all the stuff people ask me about and when I go to a wedding, I'm gonna write it down because I go to you know 50 weddings a year. So she makes her checklist and when she goes to a wedding, she writes down um, the number of guests because people wanna know are weddings getting bigger or smaller? She writes down the type of food, the type of flowers, the colors, the seating arrangements, all the data you might want to collect about a wedding. And that way, um, at the end of the wedding season, when she's meeting with clients for next year, and they're asking like, hey, what types of flowers were more popular this, you know, what types of flowers are becoming more popular? We want to have those flowers at our wedding. She is able to know because she collected the data in advance. So, um, this idea that you're going to have an action or an event and then all of this data about the event, um, this translates over to the data model that they use in Google Analytics. Um, and just so you understand, because as I, as I move to talking about Google Analytics, I have to use some Google Analytics speak. Um, so in the case of the wedding, right, and then all the data about the wedding, the wedding in Google Analytics speak would be called an event. So it is also an event in real life too, yes. Um, and then all the data you start talk about or the fields that you're collecting, those are called parameters. So in Google Analytics we have uh, events, so the action, and then the fields or extra data, those are parameters. So just like you might have clients asking a wedding planner, hey, what types of uh, centerpieces are popular? You know, when we work in tech, we're getting questions from clients or stakeholders, you know, other teams about um, what type of, what, what's going on with content on the website or, um, you know, advertising campaigns and work on all sorts of different things. So if you're getting a question from a stakeholder, um, you might say, 
you might have a, um, a content team is interested in, we want our content to be more evergreen. And we're, we're very interested in looking back and seeing, oh, what content from 2021 or 2022 is still really popular, is most popular in 2023. Um, in order to answer this question about what older content is still more popular, well, we need some fields. So we would need um, for that one, oops, I started with the second one first. For that one, in order to see, in order to look back and see um, content that was published previously, which is still popular, we need to have the publish date. Otherwise, we have no way of, contact, of identifying which content is older or newer. Um, same with the topic areas. Maybe they're planning a, uh, you know, what content are we going to, what topics are we going to write about? You know, what contractors are we going to hire to cover topics going into 2024? So if you want to look back in the last two years and see what co content topics are most popular, well, you're going to need to know what topic areas, what content categories are all of those things tagged with. So, um, it's important to be able to, I think, take these questions that you're getting and think through what data do we need to collect um, going forward so that we can answer them in the future. Because unfortunately, I, don't, I have another presentation where uh, there's, a, there's like back to the future picture with a big X through it. There is no time machine in Google Analytics, so anything you want to know, you have to set up now and then track going forward, unfortunately. So it's really important to get these questions and think this through ahead of time instead of waiting to the end of the contract or whatever reporting period and then trying to like, like retrofit is not gonna work. You can't really do that. All right, so after you get your questions and you turn your questions into fields, uh, the next step is to make sure that you actually have this data. Um, you can kind of track anything in Google Analytics, but you have to have the data, in this case, in Drupal in the first place. So um, this uh, is just a screenshot of the back end, and it shows here how everything is, is tagged. So um, if you, sometimes I work on these projects, and then at the end it's like, oh, we're not pulling in any data, and we go in the back end, and it's because half the pages um, on the site are not actually like tagged with any metadata. So. That's another thing to think about ahead of time, too. All right. OK, so step two. Um, step two is to surface. So this metadata from this screenshot, you need to, sur in order to use Google Tag Manager to collect the data and send it to Google Analytics, you first need to surface it in something called the data layer, which um, the data layer, I like to think about it as like a, a waiting room, a data waiting room. So if you're feeling sick and you want to go to the doctor, you can't just like walk off the street and straight into your doctor's office. Like you're going to have to, um, you know, hang out in the waiting room for a little bit and wait for your name to be called. You know, there's an organization process here. They just don't let anybody in immediately. It would be like chaotic. So kind of similar-ish concept with um, the data data and tag manager and your website, there is an intermediate step here um, where you need to surface the data from the back end of Drupal um, in a format in which tag manager can grab it and send it to, to Google Analytics. So the fortunately, um, with Drupal, there is a module called data layer that you can use to do this. Um, you can also get a developer to do this for you. I think um, in the case of this project with Elizabeth, we used the data layer and then had a developer help format the data so it was in an even like nicer state um, in Google Analytics. Cool, all right. Uh, step number three is to use Google Tag Manager to send the data. Sometimes when I do these things, I feel like I'm just saying Google over and over and over again. So what is Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics? I, so many analogies here. So um, I like to say that Google, um, Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager are not like two versions of the same software. Um, they are, in fact, two things that work together. So I like to uh, say that Google Analytics is like the TV programming and that Google Tag Manager is like the remote. So if you want something to appear on your TV, you need to use your remote and tell your TV, like, you know, oh, hey, I want to go stream 
the new season of The Crown on Netflix. So like go to Netflix and make that stream. So they have a similar like working together relationship. So um, to put it in a more technical way, I like to say Google Analytics is the how, <coughs> it's the data, it's a place where you can make you know, your data appear in charts and you can get those insights. And the Google Tag Manager is how you program what data gets into Google Analytics in the first place. And Google Tag Manager actually works with lots of things besides just Google, um, Google Analytics. Like you can use it for advertising tags and all sorts of different things. So on the most basic level, Google Tag Manager has tags and triggers. It's kind of like a cause and effect situation. So every time something happens in, on your website, you can create a tag that fires and sends data into Google Analytics. So back to our remote control and TV thing. It's just like every Sunday at 9 p.m., you know, go to the HBO app and stream Last of Us. So. So I say this because um, you know, this is basically how I set up all of the tracking on the RHNTC website. Um, we talked through, and it's been two years, so I'm a little fuzzy on all of the things. But basically, you know, we talked through when somebody interacts with one of uh, the toolkits, for example, you know, what are the things that we want to track? What do we, what do we want to know? Um, for example, you know, Elizabeth was interested in, we want to know when people save the toolkit. We want to know when maybe people use these links here in the sidebar to navigate through the toolkit. Like which, which things are they clicking? Because that indicates you know, which topics they're most interested in. Um, I think there's sections where you, know, you can download different resources. So what different um, resources are they downloading? Um, so basically set up Tag Manager in just is every time you know, someone clicks or downloads or submits or whatever, a tag fires from Google Tag Manager, um, capturing this data, and sends it into Google Analytics. So um, this, I, I guess this is a bit misleading because I just wanted to show, like all the metadata is on the page here, but in reality, it is not being pulled from the page. It's actually being pulled from the data layer um, with the data layer module. Awesome. So this is what it looks like in Tag Manager. I think this actually is a pretty good visualization of how this all works. So basically, every time someone clicks that Save Content button, there is a tag in Tag Manager that fires. And just like the wedding example, um, the, you have an event or an action, and then you have all of this data associated with every single action on the site. So um, every time someone clicks to Save Content, we're pulling in the page title and the program name and um, you know the, the resource type and the page topic and the page category um, just for every single save. So that means um, you know next year when Elizabeth and team are looking back and they're really curious, like, all right, so um, you know we're going to say that saving is a really good indication that somebody is very interested in this resource and they want to use it again. And so we want to know what are the most saved types of resources. Um, she can pull a report from Google Analytics or from the dashboard and look at you know, the type, most saved types of resources or um, the most saved resources within you know, the um, OPA program, the different programs. So without pulling in these parameters or these extra fields, um, you wouldn't be able to get that information. You would just get like total saves of content and you'd actually be able to pull in page URL because that comes out of the box in Google Analytics. Great. Uh, so the last step is basically um, taking this data and pulling it into a more user-friendly dashboard, um, which we have some more slides about. Did you want me to cover these? Or you're gonna... I can do it. Yeah. I guess, it... hold on, I'll do this one and then you can do this. So one thing I did want to say is for if you're used to universal analytics and now you've moved over to GA4, you will notice that Google removed so many of the standard reports. And I think it's really frustrating people, including like every time I do a training on it, uh, there's an expectation that if you want 
data, especially the sort of data that we were just talking about, like something like saves by, um, you know, resource saves by topic area over the past year. Like if you wanted to pull an, an event filtered by a specific parameter or maybe two parameters, it's really hard to get that out of the standard GA4 reports. Um, so you're expected to build like a custom report or ex an explore report. Or personally, I like Google's Looker Studio dashboard. I swear, I, I don't actually refer to Google or anything. <laughs> so <laughs> Looker Studio is a free alternative to Tableau, and I think it's pretty easy to use. Like all Google things, if you, if you stay within the universe, the stuff integrates really nicely together. So of course, like pulling in Google Analytics data into Looker Studio is very simple, and you can create these nice dashboards. Um, but there's also uh, Tableau, which I am less familiar with because working with government and nonprofit clients, they never have any money for the licensing, but uh, Tableau visualizations are very pretty. Um, but yeah, you're, you're going to, if you do do this project, you're going to need a better way to do reporting and visualize the data than is provided in the standard GA4 reports. Okay, so these are, um, thank you, Emily. Um, I should disclose my brother works for Google. I don't get any financial incentives by using all these Google <laughs> products, though. I don't think he does either. All right, so here's a snapshot of um, our new dashboard. I showed a snapshot earlier of our, and there's, there's probably like eight pages of the dashboard. We were not going to get into previewing the dashboard because that would be a, a rabbit hole. But um, you can see at the top we can filter by the date. And those two most important filters that we did not have before for us were the project components. So that's which of the three teams, and those are the three funding sources, basically like who paid for it, this project component, and then OPA program. So each of the, the larger technical assistance teams that I work with, they can come into the dashboard, just filter by their team, and the teen pregnancy prevention team, um, which is a much smaller subset of the content on our site, and they will never show up in the top five resources because their, their resources are not like required training, re required federal training. We, we, I could tell you the top five resources for this website for five years in a row, and they'll be the exact same because they're the federal training requirements. We want to see what else is happening. And so now that gives us the ability to see that you know, trauma-informed approaches and referrals and linkages, there's a couple um, just resource topics, things that are not required training, what is, what is also surfacing um, as um, the stuff that you're not required to do, that's what we want to know where people are interested in more content. And we want to see um, of the, I, we can see that overall across the site, like 64% of the traffic is for the Title 10 Family Planning Program, 21% um, is for our TPP program, and then uh, 15 is for our, we can see how that levels out by our teams. So it's much more, um, just differentiation that we didn't have before. And then specifically, um, sorry, and I, you can see, we can, we can see like which trading lists are being shared, how many, how many, which are the most saved resources, there's a lot to it. And this right here, this as a, as a snapshot of a toolkit page. So I was saying earlier, previous to having this dashboard, we literally just knew someone came to the toolkit. We had no idea what they were doing on this pretty complex page. Um, now we can see within a, you know, within a period, how many people viewed it, and then of those engaged, how engaged, who got to like 75% down the way through the page. Um, we can see of the resources that are available within that, you know, there's one resource that's getting 150 clicks and one that's getting 11. So we might not prioritize that resource is getting 11 clicks for updating. Um, we've had this project up since 2017, and so we have to do a lot of updating of our resources. Um, we can also see people really aren't using the navigation on the right very much, so that might be something from a UX perspective that we would take that navigation away and do something else with that space in the future. So um, in, in terms of like how we're actually, how this is helping us in, with report, reporting back to our funders, um, we have um, we have Looker Studio set up to send like an automatic report monthly to everyone on our team. There's 65 people on this project actually, um, with the expectation that they are looking at the resources that they're creating and seeing how they're performing. It gives everyone on the team the power to kind of dive into the data in an easy way. Um, we also like our web team. Um, we specifically, you know, go through the data every month in our team meetings. Um, look for data anomalies. Look for things that are we not expected. Um, to, to do some troubleshooting. Um, and then this data feeds into um, 
our monthly, our monthly reports, and we do um, mid-year and annual reporting infographics. So it makes, it makes um, our, we have a whole evaluation team, and, it, and they've worked with us on this dashboard. It makes pulling this, re, this, pulling this information so much faster. Um, and we're, I showed we had hundreds of resources on the site. We're going through right now and reviewing all those, so it helps us to evaluate how something has performed over time and um, have, have better, make better choices about what to prioritize for updating. And you can do this too. So I'll turn this back over to you. Perfect. So if you wanted to do something similar uh, back at uh, your organization or agency, I think these are the three types of roles you need to have on the team. So first off, a content owner, uh, you know, similar to Elizabeth, so you want someone who's able to speak to what are the needs around the content. So what are the sort of questions you're getting about the content from internal or outside stakeholders? Um, and be able to you know, articulate those and help figure out, you know, this is what we need ultimately the reports to do at the end. These are the questions we're trying to answer. Um, these are the things we need streamlined. So you need someone who can speak to that side of things. Um, you need somebody who can be in the, the middle here and be able to take those um, questions about the content and figure out how to make that work in um, Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, um, and translate, translate those questions into tracked data and set up all of this tracking, um, perhaps build out the dashboard, um, you know, that data side of things. And then also helpful to have um, with this project and other data projects is a developer. Google Tag Manager uses JavaScript and um, with Drupal, there's that nice data later, data later module that I was talking about, but sometimes like that doesn't exist or you might need something that's not in the data. You might need a data point that's not available in the module. Um, and in this case, a developer can help um, write JavaScript to kind of scrape that off the website um, or surface it from the CMS in some other way. Um, I think in this project, the developer helped reformat the data, which was available, but was in like a weird format where um, there were multiple values smushed into one field. And so it made it hard to make really nice looking charts like um, pie charts and stuff like Elizabeth showed because um, you were getting like a multi, multiple values pushed into one field. And so the developer helped um, write some script that would separate them into different fields. So um, always good to have on hand. Um, and then just to recap from before are basically what you need to do if you're trying to get from uh, website data to beautiful dashboard. Um, first, the first two things are you know, your non-technical things. You need to get very clear about what questions you have or you are getting and what data you need to answer them. So translating stakeholder questions into data fields. Um, then you need to make sure you are actually collecting that data. Um, that data is available in Drupal. Um, all your content is tagged. You have that data somewhere so that you can get it. Then you need to use the data layer module to make the data accessible to GTM. Then you need to configure GTM, Google Tag Manager, to capture all that data and send it to Google Analytics. Um, there's a little bit of work on the Google Analytics side too, that we didn't go into. Um, and then you're gonna take that data and you're gonna figure out, okay, we have all this, these like just fields, how are we gonna take that and visualize it in a way that makes it easy for the team to use? And it's like in a format where if you get a question, all you have to do is go in and like change a couple of things on the dashboard and all of a sudden you have an answer. Great, so um, I realized in the previous presentation, he turned all his like links into bit.ly's. That was really great. I should have done that. So, and I, I know for the future. Um, but I realized this is, a, this is a lot of stuff. So I wanted to leave you with some resources in case you wanted to do any, try to start any of this on your own. Um, so first off, my go-to for all things uh, Google Tag Manager, data layer, uh, is uh, Simo Ohava, he's a Finnish guy and he runs his own blog and it is an amazing resource um, for all things GTM. I also like uh, this Analytics Mania series on YouTube um, 
And these measure school articles, too, um, they are also very good and very detailed. And then uh, this, this analytics mania thing about form tracking is also just like a really great resource. So if you're trying to track things like email submissions, which is something I do a lot, uh, this has lays out like start with start with uh, A and work your way down through like 10 different ways to try and track these form submissions. So that's a good article too. Cool. All right, um, these are our email addresses and I think we have, oh, we finished on time. We have like seven minutes for questions. Yes? No, for you. Start back here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, does does GA four and I guess uh, uh, Looker Studio is that what it was called? Mm -hmm. does it integrate with Google Search Console as well. Yeah, you can add Google Search Console as a data source to Looker Studio and yeah, import the or yeah, import the Search Console data through that. When you scroll through our dashboard, it, we have a side by side of the internal search terms that people are searching when they're on the site and compared to the external search terms, like right next to each other. Amazing. Next question over here. Uh, yeah, JR from Simple Information. Um, I was just wondering if you um, were doing any A-B testing? No. Of, like A-B testing of the, of within our content strategy? Yeah. No, yeah, we haven't used it that way. Okay. Um, we've done A-B testing with some of our email campaigns, like through MailChimp, but that data which does pull into our dashboard, does, we, didn't, we didn't use it that way. But. Is that color dashboard that was Looker Studio and what customizations did you make to it? Um, just using the standard Looker Studio options. So you can create branded templates in there, which are pretty nice. So I think you all gave me your brand guidelines and you can change the colors and the fonts. And you can, I think you can make it look pretty sharp. And Looker Studio had a different name. I forget they were. Yeah, it. they were Data, Data Studio. Studio. I, I I still haven't adjusted to the Looker Studio <laughs> name, but maybe they'll change it again. Other questions? Okay. How long did it take you for this project? How many hours? Oh, I knew that was going to get asked. And oh, jeez. Like, really at the end, of it was like they're going to ask us how long this took. <laughs> we worked on it a couple over a couple of months, but mm -hmm. we were not working like we're a lot of starts and stops because we worked on a lot of different projects at once. Um, there was also the we started in Universal Analytics and then yes. they yeah. announced the end date for Universal Analytics, so we had to pivot to GA4 in the middle of the project. Yeah, there was there was like that really important step one of like knowing the data you want to collect. So we didn't actually have the program component tagged on the back end. So before we set up again, we have we wanted that data. We had to do a lot of cleaning of our own metadata first um, and just getting our ducks in a row from a. Google Analytics perspective, from our taxonomy perspective, and I also knew that I didn't want to like change our taxonomy after we had Emily do all this work and we, we were doing a taxonomy refresh. So it's hard to say exactly how long it if we just worked on it like all day long for like maybe three weeks or something. But one of the problems we had with the transition from Universal Analytics to GA4 was Booker Studio it doesn't seem to integrate as well with GA4. Did you run into that issue, or do your custom dimensions help you get around that? I've definitely run into that issue, not on this project, but yeah, just fields, some fields not being available in Looker Studio um, for GA4, but it's like they keep changing it. <laughs> so some of the problems I had at some point like had now have been fixed, so you might take a look again and see. Yeah, we had a major Looker Studio issue for well, yeah. <laughs> where we couldn't access any of the data in the dashboard because it was, it was um, yeah, it kind of paused us a little bit. Um, so you do, when you're relying on these free tools, you sort of are at the whim of the changes that come out, unfortunately. Did you combine any other tools into the dashboard? Did you pull out like um, YouTube reports or anything? I know Looker Studio yeah. allows you to bring all the data into one. So just search console for this in Google Analytics. But I, with other clients, will use a lot of other data sources too. And I often use a, another software called Supermetrics that they create data connectors. Um, and will you can connect different, 
they support all sorts of different data sources, and you can pull it into Looker Studio. Yeah, the broader dashboard that our evaluation team maintains does pull in like Mailchimp integrations and some other pieces that are separate from our web content. Yeah. So you mentioned being at the mercy of the providers of all these tools. Yeah. Have you ever looked into open source solutions that cover the same ground, like Matomo for analytics? I have not, but I'll have to do that in the future. Yeah, the as Elizabeth mentioned, yeah, Google changed like their API, something with how many API calls you can make that then broke the dashboard and all of my other clients' dashboards for like several months. So yeah, it is it is a it's very frustrating. Yeah, it's a problem. I was wondering about um, the custom parameters you're talking about, how to apply them to like default data and not just new events that you created. Like page views, like applying page topic to page views. In GA4, so yeah, if you, okay. Um, so yeah, it, it GA4 collects page views like out of the box. So if you do want to take, if you do want to collect custom parameters for events that it's already tracking, you'll have to actually turn that off. Oh, wait, no, they changed this. This is, this is a new thing that they changed in GA4. I think you can, hold on. You can either turn it, you can turn it off and create custom uh, triggers and events in, in Google Tag Manager, um, which is what we did here. So you're basically recreating what already works. Yeah. Um, or you can now add parameters like in... The event settings variable maybe? In the like, Google Tag, I think they just came out with that. Like, yeah. Yeah, there's some new options to explore, so you can see if you can do it that way without having to totally yeah, recreate yeah. it. But I have not done it yet. When they make these changes that affect your work, you know, your tracking or your stuff, or your dashboards, do they send any type of warning so that you can at least try to preempt this type of stuff? <laughs> yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like the the Looker Studio thing was a huge one, and it just changed all of a sudden. And you, you look online, and there's nothing. Like it took weeks for, you know, other agencies and Google and other places will put out solutions, but it's just it's very frustrating. Was it an issue with the data connection? Or... Yeah, I think it had to do with like how many how many times you could like call the API, I don't know, I'm not a developer, so, um, and so, like, sites where you had, a, we were pulling, like, a lot of different data, um, it just... We immediately hit our data quota. Yeah. Oh, like, you, it was just non-functional. You oh, just wow. get broken, like, a little, some sad little image that tells you you can't, you, you, we could visualize nothing, so. We could still go back into Google Analytics and see that kind of, like, default data, but the dashboard itself would kind of became non-operational. Um, and I was like, is there something I can pay for to get special access? <laughs> no, no. There was, it wasn't even, it was just they had changed. You know, it's just what happens. You, they released something, and then they don't think they anticipated the consequences. Um, and we had to wait until we fixed it. Last question before we wrap up. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks.